Uh, this chapter is the peripheral nervous system, and as you know, peripheral means outside. So it's everything outside of the brain or the spinal cord, which is the central nervous system. I like to think of it as the wires that go in and then also the wires go out. But of course, that's an oversimplification. In this chapter, we're going to be referring to three primary structures. The first structure is the peripheral nerves. These are the so-called wires that I just mentioned, the associated ganglia, and a ganglia, remember, is a group of cell bodies. So it's a group of cell bodies where there are neurotransmitters that are going to be released and they bind to another neuron. And then finally, we're going to be talking about the motor endings. And recall from chapter 9, the skeletal muscle physiology, that a motor ending would be in the skeletal nervous or in the skeletal muscle that would be the neuromuscular junction so we're going to be referring to something that you've already learned about before so the job of the peripheral nervous system is to provide links to and from the external environment so very very important and our next slide is from your so two of the important characteristics that can describe the sensory receptors are that of the word sensation and the word sensation is referring to awareness it's the idea of us being aware of our environment aware of a stimulus and then there is also what is referred to as perception and as you know obviously everybody's perception is different and the perception is based on interpretation so it's the interpretation of the sensory information that is sent to the brain and we'll be talking about some of these individual receptors coming up in the next slide so we want to look at the red over here the red area which is the motor or the efferent division so you need to know that motor means the same as the efferent with an e and again sensory means afferent with an a and the motor division includes the voluntary nervous system which is what controls skeletal muscles and that is the somatic nervous system and then there's also an autonomic component the automatic portion of the peripheral nervous system that we can't control so there's two divisions of it there's the sympathetic division and you may have heard of this before possibly in a psychology class but sympathetic means fight or flight and we'll be talking a lot more in detail about this in chapter 14. And the parasympathetic division is just going to be the opposite. And so the really cool thing about the autonomic nervous system is that both of these uh, divisions are going to be working simultaneously on an organ. The, the parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest nervous system. So let's go ahead and look at the different types of receptors that you have that are listed in your book and again these receptors are going to be classified based on three different characteristics and you can see those characteristics listed for you over here in this table uh, first of all there's going to be the type of stimulus that they detect and that would be something like um, mechanical stimulation temperature stimulation as it shows here no susceptors are pain receptors mechanoreceptors are pressure receptors also they are um, determined by their body location which is what this L stands for here so exteroceptor as you can probably figure out means external to the body on the skin and also their structural complexity some of them are going to be very um, simple that we're learning about in this chapter but when we get to chapter 15, we're going to be learning about more complex types of receptors. And these complex receptors are, of course, the special senses. So at this point, we're just learning about simple ones. And you need to know the ones that are in this table on this slide and also on the next couple slides. And you've probably seen these before. They look um, fairly familiar to you. The first one is a naked dendrite, meaning that it does not have any sort of tissue surrounding it. 
you can see the dendrite is located right here in the area that I circled. There are also tactile or Merkel discs, which you may remember are in the basal layer of the epidermis. Remember that was the deepest layer. There's also hair follicle receptors, which are nerve receptors that are located around the hair follicle itself, and they respond to mechanical receptors. So, for example, when you're pulling on somebody else's hair, that's going to activate the mechanoreceptors that are at the base of the hair follicle. Our next slide shows the next part of this table in your book, and it shows the tactile or the Meisner's corpuscles. And the term tactile is really kind of more general. The, the term Meisner is a little more specific. And these are located a little deeper in the skin, in the dermis. Whereas on the previous slide, the Merkel cells that we saw are located in the epidermis. There's the Piscinian corpuscles, and remember these are located very deep in the dermis, specifically the reticular layer of the dermis. And then finally we have what are called bulbous corpuscles or Ruffini endings, and uh, you can see where they're located, and they're also in the joint capsules. So this next slide here is showing you two different types of receptors, which are referred to as proprioceptors, and proprioceptors are going to be uh, sensing information about muscle st stretch, muscle length, also tendon stretch and tendon length, and joint capsules as well. So they are constantly sending information to a part of the brain called the cerebellum, which you remember from last uh, chapter from the central nervous system is constantly receiving information from the body and making decisions about uh, what the best next muscle movement is going to be. So our final slide for this first section is uh, the summary of these receptors. So um, your textbook lists the different characteristics that are used to classify these receptors and they are classified by the location, as we can see here by this first bullet. The three options for location are either near or at the body surface, external to the body, deep within the body, so they could be visceral receptors, they could be receptors that are lining a blood vessel, for example, but they're inside the body. So chemoreceptors would be an example of this. Any receptors that are in a tissue, and there's Finally, proprioceptors, which remember are the ones that are constantly advising the brain about brain and the cerebellum of movements. These would be things like the Golgi tendon receptor that you saw on the last slide. They would be things like the muscle spindle and finally the, um, the joint kinesthetic receptors. The second classification is by stimulus. Usually you can figure out what a lot of these are because of the prefix, chemical, Thermal is temperature, mechanical is pressure, and nociceptor is going to be pain. The one that is going to be, um, what we're not going to talk about until chapter 15, is the photoreceptor. Photoreceptors are the one example of complex receptors, and the ones that we've seen so far in this, unit, in this chapter are the simple receptors, and they are either unencapsulated or they are encapsulated. If they are encapsulated, what that means is they are enclosed by a connective tissue capsule, kind of like the Piscinian corpuscle. So if this first red line that I drew right here is the dendrite, if we see connective tissue layers around the dendrite, then it would be encapsulated. However, if there were no um, layers around it, if it was a naked dendrite, then it would be unencapsulated.